everybody who's coming into the way into the room. Um, I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the community services director for the Larkspur Library. Um, for a lot of our patrons, we have been closed for the last few weeks that um, some of the staff got sick. And so, in the, as you know, there's only five of us. So when half of us are sick, there's no one left to work at the library. So we will be reopening tomorrow for curbside service. It'll be our first day back in. Um, so if you had books and material waiting to pick up, um, just give us a call um, tomorrow or email us tonight and we'll make sure that it's ready for you um, tomorrow. So I guess I should turn my little light on. Um, see if this makes me look any different. <laughs> so again, um, thank you all for joining us. We'll get started in a couple minutes and I'm trying to figure out why my little, oops, oops. Can you guys still see the welcome screen? No, I can oh, see yeah. Laurel and Franklin. Okay, let me, how did yep. I mess this up? <laughs> I think I hit the wrong button. Share. There we go. Hi, Claire. Hi, Jessica. So here we go. So, so welcome everybody. Um, today we're, um, we'll do be doing questions and answers towards the end. But if you think of a question when you're um, when we're talking, make sure that you um, just put it in the Q and A, and then I'll relay those questions to our author. Um, and today we're we're here with Mindy. I realized I didn't figure out how to say your last name. It's Urlob or? It's Urlob. Urlob. So, and we're here today to talk about her, her book, Unnatural Resources. So um, again, we'll start in a few moments as, as more people join us. Um, also too, don't forget to follow us on our social media. We try to put a lot of updates on our social media. And again, for those of you who've been waiting for the library to reopen, we will be reopening tomorrow on Saturday and January 30th. So thank you for your patience um, while we've been out sick and recovering. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people have been missing us and we've been missing you guys too. So, um, but we'll be, be back in service tomorrow. Um, and then we'll resume our normal curbside next week, Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to four. Okay, so it's two o'clock. So um, thank you all for joining us. Let me stop the share. And then we're actually here with Amindi Urlap, the author of Unnatural Resource, uh, Resources. You can see it here. It's a, it's a good book. And we're also here with Laurel Hilton um, from the Marin Writer's Nest, who's, um, I guess, your publicist or your... Publicist. Publicist, <laughs> publicist for Mindy. Okay, so uh, I guess for, first, uh, just welcome Mindy. Th um, thank you for um, for sharing this book with us. It is now in our collection, everybody too. So um, you can also put a hold on it and we'll talk about where you can buy it towards the end. But I really would just like Mindy to start off to, with, to give us a little bit about her background and um, that we'll start the conversation that way, so. Um, hi everybody, I'm Mindy Erlob and uh, my Geez, my background is, it's sort of, I sort of took a non-traditional path toward um, becoming an author. Um, I grew up in uh, the Chicago area and I thought that I was gonna go away to college and um, join a sorority and probably marry a nice Jewish doctor and ended up uh, going to college and joining a band and uh, never marrying a nice Jewish doctor, but ended up marrying a wonderful non-Jewish cowboy. <laughs> um, so anyway, the I started off by writing in a band called 40th Day. Um, I played in that band for about eight years and um, continue to play with them now and again, even though I'm um, middle-aged. And uh, we had a pretty good run. And while I was playing in the band. I was studying mass communications with an emphasis on screenwriting and really enjoyed the writing process and decided to pursue my master's degree. So in between touring and practicing with the band, um, I went to grad school and ended up getting my master's degree in communications with an emphasis on screenwriting. I ended up um, for my doctoral, for my, my uh, thesis, I ended up um, writing a screenplay for my dissertation. And basically the screenplay just became a project for another sort of eight year capsule of my life where I 
wrote, produced, and directed all of the editing of this feature length film that was about playing in a rock and roll band that was on tour. And um, actually I have a sort of visual aid here. I have it on DVD. It's actually right here, it's called Stalled. Mm -hmm. um, the only excuse I'll make for it is that I wrote it when I was in my twenties. Um, so anyway, I've, I've just sort of always been a writer of something, whether it be music or film. And um, I picked up a book called King Leopold's Ghost, which is written by Adam Hochschild. Mm -hmm. And this was probably a couple of years after I had sold the rights to my film. And that book just changed my life. And it taught me about um, colonial Africa and um, Leopold of Belgium and all of the atrocities in Congo. And, um, you know, this is sort of in the early aughts, I guess. And I, and I sort of wanted to write a story about somebody from Congo. And it was in the back of my mind. And during all this time, I was a part of a group called the Write On Mamas. Um, we do essays and speaking engagements and, and um, used to have monthly meetings and everything. We actually put out a couple of books. Um, here's some more shameless self-promotion, but these are the Writing Mamas books. Um, Mama's right, and she's got this. Mm -hmm. So I was in this writing group that was really supportive and have a really supportive husband. And basically when I said, I wanna go to Congo to learn about people there and I wanna do more research, he said, okay. And so I spent a couple of years trying to get there. It's not the easiest place to get to. Um, it's, it's a war zone a lot of the time mm -hmm. and it's, it's an area in conflict. Um, but uh, I found myself writing this story before I ever even went. I, I wanted to write a story about girls and women who um, succeed in Congo because the stories that I had been writing were mostly just stories that I heard about women suffering and not succeeding. And so when I went there, I realized how strong women actually are and and what they can actually accomplish and so anyway that's that's sort of my background that's how I came to write this book yeah and so an, un, an un, unnatural resources takes place in the Congo so this is a it's actually a, two, a story of two people Therese and Laurel uh, Luna and then um so the the big thing was is that the, I mean it's a very powerful book because it is um, and like you said, but you have the, the personal experience and the knowledge because you did interview personally a lot of these survivors of these vicious attacks. And, and that's, you know, when you're writing about this, that, that was one of the things I really wanted to ask you is like, um, as an author, where did you want to, you know, how far did you want to take a description of, of, I mean, the book starts off um, sort of, you know, you know, Therese and uh, Virgil and Felix, but then it automatically is you're pulled into this tragedy that's happened. And when authors are, are dealing with issues of rape, um, where did you want to draw the line not to be too graphic? And where do you want to, to make sure that people know the kind of impact a rape can have on a, a, a survivor? I mean, yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, the truth is that rape impacts survivors in different ways. Some people end up deeply traumatized. Some people move on. Some, they all feel it. Obviously, it's a horrible thing to happen. But when I want then, I wanted the author to understand what it was like. Like when I was in Congo, I went twice with Human Rights Watch and with Eve Ensler's V-Day. You know, people are very encouraged to tell their stories. It helps them heal. And, you know, I had people reach across the table and tell me things like, I was raped in the jungle and, you know, I had to have my baby and then the baby was taken away from me. And then I, and I, I feel, you know, whatever the story was, you know, or, or, you know, I was shot in, you know, my privates or whatever, whatever they say is, it, it's horrific stories. And they reach across the table and they hold your hand. They ask you to take they ask you to take you, them home with you to the U.S. They don't want to stay in Congo because the militia groups are so violent and so vicious. And 
you know, I wanted the reader to understand what it was like to hold the hand of a rape survivor in Congo. Um, I didn't necessarily have to get into the minutia of body parts and, um, you know, I mean, I, I guess, I guess I'm not afraid of saying what I think happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, it, did, it wasn't, it didn't happen to me and I can only relate the story from their mouths, mm -hmm. but um, I wanted it to be true. I wanted it to, it to ring true, even though it was a novel. And I think that all novelists kind of have that, they have that prerequisite in terms of writing. I mean, like if you're writing a novel and it doesn't seem true, then, then why write it, you know? <laughs> Well, and too, and this is when you've heard these stories, and I mean, because there are so many, like the side characters, you know, um, I want to say Hirote, the, um, the, the other survivors of these different attacks, and they don't, and you, I mean, the story, it's, it's very true, because not every person survives in this book. And not every person. And then too, there's also the boys. You do talk about the boys and their attack. And um, that was one of my, the one person I think who doesn't really get a voice because I know you were, we were focused on, the book is focused on Teresa and Luna. It's her little brother and his, like this could be your follow-up novel. Right. Is, is um, uh, Felix's journey. Because this is, I mean, Teresa, it's, it's a hard thing to, to read because you know Teresa's around 11, 11, 12? When it I mean, starts, yeah. And it's, so you know this is, it's a vicious thing. Um, and then you know her brother is a little younger and you know that, I mean, towards that part of the book where she's reunited um, with her brother, it, it's, that's the hard part because you know he has been traumatized so badly. Right. Um, but I, I guess that that's the thing is you've had this experience of talking to these survivors and I think you've done a wonderful job of, of sharing their stories. And, and I think that's the, the part of the research. And so how long did it take you to, to, to do all this research? And I mean, it sounds like you worked on this book for quite a while too. I mean, the research happened, it started the second I pick up, picked up King Leopold's ghost. So it was probably the, you know, probably 2000 to 2003. And here we are in 2020, mm -hmm. one. But, um, you know, really the actual, like, like the sort of pen on paper happened um, in 2011. And so it was just sort of interest and ideas percolating for years and years and years. Um, and then, and then the sort of throat clearing part of it ended and I was like, well, you know what, I'm going to write this and I'm going to take a crack at it. And um, so the, so the real writing of the actual story took about five years and then the rewriting and the, um, the rewriting and the, and the trying to get it out there took another five years. So, I mean, I, I just think that when you go into a book like this, um, go into any kind of book to rush it and to, to say, I'm just going to bang this out, you know, you can bang out the first draft, but there's always something more that goes into making a book. I mean, whether it's research or rewriting or querying or whatever it is, um, if you're gonna do it the right way, you gotta be all in for, for the entire journey, right? Mm -hmm. So. No, and, and that was like one of my things is like, what got left out? What, what are these, of these stories that you were telling that you just thought you couldn't put down on paper? Oh. You couldn't, I mean, especially when you hear a survivor story and yeah. you're trying to keep their privacy as well. Right. Um, where does the, the, the split between fiction and reality, where, how do you mend that to make sure that you're not being too personal? Did, did do you have that challenge when you're writing this or? Yeah, I mean, I had, I had, um, those are two really distinct questions because they both, they both have big answers, you know, like this book had started off in three parts. It was uh, Luna's, it was Teresa's part, her mother Luna's part, and then Brianna's part. And Brianna is one of the sort of philanthropic aid worker people who comes to, um, to, to interview them. And so 
that story, a lot of it took place in California mm -hmm. and in it, in it showed um, one of the characters coming to live in Marin County and what that was like. It was, it was a little bit like, you know, like El Norte or something like that, where, you know, somebody from a different country comes across the border and it's just completely shocking. Um, and, it, and that was Brianna's story and the publisher just wouldn't have it. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, the publishers were basically on board with this story, you know, from the beginning, but they were convinced that like it, it just slowed down, like the urgency of the story slowed way down when it moved to the US. And that totally makes sense because, you know, while people are raped and tortured here and there are people who are marginalized and subjugated and discriminated against, we don't have the, I mean, it's not the rape capital of the world. So it's just not, it doesn't have the urgency. So that part got left out. And, and interestingly enough, um, Franklin, to your point, um, before I had this publisher, I was very, for a very brief moment there, so I had signed with an agent. And that agent asked me to replace the middle part with Felix's story. And so I actually wrote Felix's Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> I do have, okay, I do have, I do have Felix's book. Um, he, it, it, I do have his book already written. So um, it's just waiting to happen. Because I, I think for me as a reader, that was one of these things, because there are, you have the, these, a brother and a sister and the unbrother Virgil, and you right. know that they have this close bond with them. I mean, right. the, the horrible part too, I mean, for Virgil's story, it's just that the fear of being separated and, mm -hmm. and knowing that you don't have any place to go back to mm -hmm. and that this hospital that is your sanctuary, you right. do anything to stay. And when he, I, I guess, flings himself off the, the, uh, the playground thing and he ends up breaking his leg again, that's how he stays. But th those are, it's, there's, there's so much, I think you could probably write a whole nother book on if you don't already have it done, there, there's all these little bits and pieces. But I think right. that the powerful story is the two parts that make up the book. It's it's um, Luna's and it's Therese. And um, uh, to me, the the most horrible part of the book for me to read is is Luna's story. I mean, you with um, Therese, we we see the growth of her character because she's also aging over time mm -hmm. in the book. Um, but she also has these, you know, these angels that sort of come in and help Brianna, who who helps right. her um, with the education. But it's not just helping her, but helping all these other girls as well. And, and, and that's that that light at the end of the tunnel for them. Where when we do get to the second half of the book, um, and that was my other thing, I guess, is really why did you, to split the book up like this instead of having it go back and forth. What what made you decide to say, I'm gonna tell Teresa's story first and then I'm gonna tell Luna's story? That um, really, I think that that happened because, well, it was gonna be three people's stories mm -hmm. and, and it was gonna be a women's, women's stories. And I was gonna, break it up and kind of go back and forth and back and forth. But in order to understand, you know, I, I don't want to tell too much about the book, but there's, there's a, a very important reason why I can't tell Luna's story at the beginning mm -hmm. and I can't weave them together because, um, I mean, really they have their own stories and they each have very distinct experiences under the general, who's the sort of the bad guy of this story is, you know, the, the, the evil leader of the militia group is named the general. Um, so, you know, they, they each have an experience with him, but it's really different because mm -hmm. one is an adult and one is a child. And, you know, um, they both, you know, and Therese has a totally different path where she can, she can, she can encounter angels and Luna's path is not like that. She doesn't have, she doesn't encounter the same angels. And, you know, as a mother, like I, I think it's very impactful to write a mom's story because to be separated from your children, um, to not know that your children are okay, um, 
that that just I just think that that it's a powerful story in that way. Um, and and to me, you know, when you ask like what part are what part is real and what part isn't real, that that panic that that um, that Luna feels like I don't know if I don't know where my family is. I don't, I, you know, she doesn't know if she was the only one taken. She doesn't know what happened. So. I don't know. I just, I just thought her story was very rich and I didn't want to slight her. Well, no. And I think too, that th there's a huge difference as well too, because Therese is a child. She doesn't know who these people are. And so she, like, you know, refers to them as the bad men where right. the mom would have a more knowledge of, of the politics of the world and the dangers of the world. But I, exactly. I, and that, that's, I think, and you're right. You, the way this, the story is now, I think is great because it's, something that most readers don't get to see. And that's why I really do like Luna's part of the story because you get that, um, and I don't want to end, ruin the book, but it's just, you get the sign of things that you, you're not left wondering too much about Therese. Um, and I think that, and it is, it's, you, you have shown how women can survive and become. And I think even the director of the school, when she relays her story to Luna, it, it's, it is this, you know, bad things happen but you rise above it and and that was the kind of message that that a lot of the book has and i um i think we talked about this when we first talked too is that this is still going on in africa that, that, oh yeah and and i know that uh people who know stuff about aids i mean that was it's true i mean this is aids has been the biggest epidemic um to the african continent and the way you handle it in the book as well was one of these things it's it's a scary thing and and how someone could get infected and die so quickly and i think there's um one character who we um, see that happen to mm -hmm. Um, and then we have other ones that were like, you know, just the, this relationship that, and I thought it was, it's a sad thing, but it is true as well, is that women who are attacked, who get thrown away by their families because they've been attacked, or they've been, you know, get pregnant by a rapist, mm -hmm. that this is, it's not, for people who don't know, this is really what happens to a lot of these women in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was a great thing to bring in because you are sprinkling the reality of, of the way that these women are treated in Africa. Because unless you really, I, like I think you've talked about that, how it, it comes and flows in the news stories when we hear about Africa and the kind of violence that had been going on. Um, I think there's even a part in the book where you talk about a genocide that had happened. Um, that we hear it as news bits in our part of the world. Um, and then we forget, not realizing that these kind of tragedies are constantly happening. And yeah. these women who survive these kind of attacks are still out there, you know, trying to, to create a better life. Well, yeah. And like, for me, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I live here. I could come back here. Right. But there are the, there, there are boots on the ground there. And they, they live there. And, and, you know, yes, we, we get bummed out about the fact that we have to wear a mask when we go out. I mean, could you imagine, like, being more than a little terrified that a militia group will just plow through your village? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so um, it, is, it is a thing. I mean, it's, it, it, it gives you a little lump in your throat, you know, living in Marin County in such, amid such splendor and opulence, right? So, yeah. Well, I, I think too, that's the reason too, we, we you, as a writer, you're gonna write, you're gonna bring these stories to life. And I, that's why I think too, you're working with tr real survivors, getting their stories. This is a way to actually pass that story on to other people who don't know. And and that I think what Br Brianna does in the, in the story, um, and I, you get that, there's a little part where you do talk about where Therese does get to go live in the United States, just in right. the second half of the book. So we know that there's a chunk of time that we don't see, but it's also the impact of living somewhere else and then the way your your friends and family see you when you come back. And right. you dealt with that too in the book that, you know, when Mr. Um, I guess mm -hmm. the book, yeah. Um, is saying you were spoiled, you were spoiled um, mm -hmm. to her. And it's like, but it's, that was one thing that you, and I, I know that people do get sponsored, you know, they get, um, people have sent people to high school 
um, her friend that she first meets in the um, in the hospital mm -hmm. gets to go yeah, to Odette. school. Yeah, Odette. Um, that we know that their their lives have turned a corner, but it's still that a lot of them that have been um, they've lost so much that you know how does this this one little you know great thing make it a life? And then even the part where they go to the island when the boat breaks down. Um, that it's it's just a strange thing. And there, there's all these characters too. I want to know where did that person come from? Where did that? Well, uh, I mean, okay. So the island story. I mean, I don't know how many people from Human Rights Watch are on this call right now, but um, that actually really did happen. Um, you know, I was on a boat and and I was with a bunch of locals and a bunch of aid workers and people from Human Rights Watch, and our little tiny dinky boat broke down. And we were in the middle of this, you know, lake that's the size of an ocean. And, you know, we sort of puttered onto this island where there were there was this old, um, I guess there was a hotel on the island or something. There were a bunch of people living there. And it was surreal being in the middle of this giant lake on this island. And, and seeing, you know, you kind of think, oh, this looks like it would have been a really nice resort or whatever it was there. It was a beautiful beach and, you know, the kids, the kids are adorable and beautiful and they've, they're holding their hands up and everything. And, you know, they have lice and runny noses and stuff that like, you just don't really, you just don't really see here, you know, and, and you just, your heart goes out to them. Like you just want to give them whatever you can, but you know, it, it's, yeah. So that's how that came about. That actually, I mean, I didn't take people directly from Congo and put them in the book without changing their names. But I, though that circumstance, actually, that actually was a real scene. Well, that yeah, really it, that real experience that you draw on to add to the book. And it, it added to the, because we know this from the, the building up to that scene where they first get to the boat, that there's all these problems with the boat. The slow <laughs> boat, the, the, um, even when you're on this boat and you realize, oh no, it's broken down. And then, yeah, you're, Therese has to face the, you know, you know, these kids and people on this island are sort of protected because they're on the island, but they're right. still, gra you know, grasping with the poverty, with right. the, with the, um, the, you know, just like when the, um, the, was it Brianna who bought like the basket of bananas? Yeah. The lady was just shocked yeah. that you know, somebody bought all the, and then she just hands them all out to everybody. It was just right. like a thing that, you know, that I think the people who do go on this, these work, these missions are doing, they're trying so hard to help so many people. And right. um, sometimes it can feel like it's overwhelming and you get that oh, that sense of overwhelming that, you know, they're trying to tell the story of the, um, the free child slave group that's mm -hmm. trying really hard. But then there's also this underlying fact where the people um, like Robert, who's telling Therese to get paid Mm -hmm. um, to get paid. And, and that's something that you wouldn't think of in a tragedy, but they're also trying to think of how they're going to survive in the future. Um, and, and that's a real thing too. You know that this, this happens, right? Well, yeah. I mean, like, um, people who have traveled abroad and been to third world countries, I mean, you give somebody a handout, you give them um, some money or some food or whatever. And then what happens when you leave? Like, what's going to happen? Like, what, you know, I mean, people have to find a way to be able to support themselves when they don't have parents, you know, when they don't have parents around. So, yeah, and actually, I mean, I hope that one of the things that I can convey in this book is that, I mean, these people have resources. They have, they've got serious resources. And that's, that's why it's called unnatural resources. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, these people have, they have, um, you know, the gift of language, they have the gift of smarts, all the things that like, it isn't just that they have like oil in their lake. It's that like, they've got like chutzpah and like strength and tenacity and all the stuff that they have. So um, yeah, it isn't just about getting a banana, you know, it's like, there's more, there's so much more to it, right? Well, no, no and we see that, that Therese has the opportunity to grow and, you know, when she gets to go to the school and she, right. because her mother was um, one of these, you know, broad thinkers to teach her daughter and her, all her children, two languages that, you know, they know English, they know Swahili, they know uh, French. So 
they they have that leg up to where you know Therese gets to be a teacher as well as a student mm -hmm. um and it's that's a benefit that you know people they always say that people who are bilingual and trilingual you know they're much more smarter than everybody else because they can process all these different things um and you get to see this in Therese you get to see how um, this sort of puts your uh, leg up that some of the girls are jealous about um, and, and I, I think that all the interplay that you have with all the different characters um, that she meets at um, on the farm, on the little farm mm -hmm. village. Yeah, yeah. Who are, who are you know, you, they've all been through horrible things, but then they start getting jealous of silly things. Um, right. But in, uh, you, Therese has to face that. And then, so that kind of stuff, was that something to you when you were doing the research, you, you kept coming across how someone else could be jealous of somebody else? Not, no, I mean, I have two teenage boys. <laughs> That's how I write that. It's like, you know, I mean, kids who are 11, you know, or 15 or whatever, they get jealous of each other. It's just the way kids are. And I, and, you know, I never wanted to, I, I mean, these, this child is heroic, right? She's her own hero, but she's still a kid. And, you know, kids are still, you know, they're still obnoxious to each other. So, um, you know, I like the idea of there being like, both angels and devils in her midst. So, cause that's, that's what real life is like. I mean, we all had a mean bully in school, right? Like anybody listening, I can guarantee you, everybody here knows that mean bully. And, you know, I, I, I liked, I liked that mean bully character, Mwamini, cause she sounded mm -hmm. like a meanie. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, th that's the one that sort of sort of picks at her when she's yeah. on the farm, and it's just, yeah, right. I think, and that's what sort of makes Therese also stops telling people yeah. <laughs> that she, you know, she was yeah. helping the film crew, um, and it's not because, um, it's not like she went out and looked, looking for it, they sort of found her and right. wanted to, to follow her around, so it's not so much that she did it out of um and especially too when she first starts doing it when we know she's just doing it because she wants to get her family back right um that other people are like you know sort of telling her to get paid for it to do all this other stuff right. that was what was this you know it is that strange and, and what do you do when you're because to you sort of forget that she's so young yeah. that she's so young and this has happened to her and she's such a young child yeah um and all these other people who are, are, and you're just like wondering, are they really watching out for her? Are they really holding on to her? And I'm left with that feeling of like, um, you just hope that it's for the best. And, and I think it is, it, it is the best for Therese. Um, did, did you want to, you wanted to do a little bit of reading, but we're going to do it from Luna's side of the story, right? Or Yeah, is this a good time for that? Yeah, let's let's um, have you do a little reading and I'll spotlight you. So you all right. center stage here, so. All right, so um, so this is um, when Luna, um, Teresa's mother, has been taken by the general as a translator, and she's attempting an escape with a child soldier by the name of Manny and his uncle Erv, and they have saved Manny's mom, whose name is Rojo, and a neighbor girl named Sylvia. Um, Luna has sustained several injuries, including a sprained knee, during her escape. We all had slavery stories to share. The general had turned Uncle Erv into a workhorse and had made Manny a soldier and used Rojo, Sylvia, and me for his manly pleasures. Under the general, we all had something in common. Terror fuses people together like this. I had no idea what fate had befallen my family, but I prayed silently that if they were separated from each other, they could find a temporary caring community as I had. We trudged through the dense forest. Luckily, there was a clear animal trail that wound through the trees. I had to avoid stepping in very large droppings. They did not resemble what the gorillas had left behind, so I asked Uncle Erv about the animal that deposited them. Buffalo, he guessed. It's more than one, so we don't really have to worry. We'd be in trouble walking around here if there were just one. I was aware that buffalo could stampede, and I did not understand until he explained that a solitary buffalo feels vulnerable and can charge unrelentingly at an interloper. Many people in the area feared losing their lives at the horns of a buffalo. I shivered as I thought about the oncoming darkness, the volcano, the militia, the wild animals, and my limp. As if reading my mind, Erv said, Manny and I can carry you. 
The group stopped and awaited my answer. Little Sylvia clutched my hand and prompted me. I looked around at the expectant faces, urging me to accept. I knew that in the past, many dead people had to be carried out of the general's underground jail. And I thought about Sylvia and Rojo and the other women starving in the cell and being carried to a nearby grave. There was no way anyone was going to carry me out if I was still alive. The only way I'd be carried out of this forest is if I were dead. You can carry me, Sylvia chirped. Manny crouched down and let Sylvia jump on his back. She weighed next to nothing, but he still groaned with the effort. Only when I saw that Sylvia was tended to did I allow Arif to give me his arm. Between my walking stick and his elbow, I almost felt as though I could walk normally. Rojo hummed a familiar tune and Arif and Manny joined in. It took my mind off our situation to puzzle out where I had heard this song. Maybe it was something the children in the choir sang at the church on the long road. We went on like this for quite a while until a terrible sound made us freeze in mid-step. It was an explosion, someplace off to our left, and it appeared as if the entire jungle had heard it. The chattering birds quieted. It was so still that the trees seemed empty of their inhabitants. Then something in the forest started keening like a baby. It sounded like it was being tortured or maybe eaten. Suddenly, it sounded as if thousands of creatures descended the mountain. We quickened our pace heading to the right, but had no idea what was coming from behind. Manny tried to keep up with his mother, but had the burden of Sylvia on his back. Erev pulled me along forcefully into the dense forest. If I had been lost and disoriented already, I was hopeless now. I tried to plant my walking stick and keep up with him, but I dropped it and with both hands, I clung to his elbow. Suddenly, a giant ball of hot rock landed on our left. It hit a tree and burst into flames. The forest around it began to burn and we ran. Sylvia screamed as Manny rushed her through burning branches while I clenched against the pain as Erev gathered me to his side, my feet barely touching the ground. After an agonizing hour of running, we appeared to be much lower down, but could still smell burning trees. Erev guided us toward some large boulders and we sat on the downward slope to rest for a moment. None of us spoke. We could hear gunfire on the other side of the mountain. There was a battle being waged against the general's militia outpost. I smiled as I thought about the monoscope transmission I failed to translate. The others stared at me as if I were crazy. With hellfire raining down all around us and darkness falling, I was smiling. It was contagious. Erev started to laugh and then his sister joined in. Then Manny and Sylvia. We sat like that, eating melted candy bars and watching the fiery boulders crash and burn all around us. We could hear screams from the distant outpost, but none of us knew if they were under siege from the volcano or the UN. I ceased worried, worrying about everything. I think the others felt it too. There were so many ways to dif so many different ways to die in Congo, and here we were alive, and we were laughing. Okay, un unmute myself. No, I think that this was, a, it's a great part of the book too, because in, in this part, in Luna's section, we really get to see the um, the other things that are going on in the Congo, like the poaching, um, the, the, um, the hunting in the park, and how the general was sort of hiding from the government, and sort of, I think uh, Irv said it best in plain sight, right? <laughs> they're, they're hiding inside the jungle, and then, um, here they are, like, you know, they can't find him, and they, they do, I think that there's so much that, that Luna's story brings to, the, also to, to help with the downfall of the general, because she's translating these messages, and then hides that one that sort of would have tipped him off, that they were coming for him. Right. Um, and, and I guess what, so adding all the, the stuff about the poaching, um, why, why did you do that when everything else in the story is so powerful and then you have this whole poaching of a, of a gorilla in the... You know, um, part of what people do with countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo is they use up the natural resources like minerals, like animals, like firewood that gets turned into... Um, charcoal and overused. And I think the idea behind it is that to a lot of the world, 
um, I mean, we have sort of commodified this, um, this entire continent. And I guess this is sort of the way that we are as human beings to do this to people. And, you know, I think that it isn't just what we do to our, to our, you know, our fellow human beings, but it's what we do to our fe fellow human beings land mm -hmm. and, and the wildlife around them. I mean, gorillas are, are going extinct for lots of reasons, but the biggest one is uh, human beings. You know, I mean, we are the most dangerous thing in those jungles. And um, I had a great experience when I was in DRC where I got to actually um, see and meet the gorillas who are the, um, the fabled gorillas in the mist. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, they're incredible animals and they're incredible they're an incredible part of our of our world and our our ecosystem and they're so like us and 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 not like us and i think that the idea between like of poaching a gorilla is you're just killing off another creature you know that that is a creature just like we are you know so well no and you also you in that this whole escape, you have that beautiful moment of the baby, the, the young gorilla with the mom mm -hmm. and, and the shoes, that, that this is this, you know, all this craziness that's happening around them. You know, they're, they're fleeing, they're running away, the volcano's going off. And then there's this beautiful moment where there's the, the, the young gorilla comes out, picks up her shoe that she's dropped and then plays with the shoe. And then they realize that the whole, um, family is around. The, the gorillas right. are hiding in the trees looking at right. them. It's this just this like one this yeah I just thought it was like this amazing thing to have in this book that you have this one little of where you know the the survivors of you know their escape but then they come across these this little family that's hiding also like them hiding, yeah. hiding from the rest of the world but it's just this beautiful interaction that they have that oh, was thank a great you. book um, I like that part too actually yeah so um yeah I, I guess maybe if we see have any questions from the audience you know there's still so much to talk about but I, I like I said I don't want to ruin the book I want people to read this book it's a great book like you said um, and it's a, a fast read, but it's it, like it's, it's a powerful story and it can be disturbing in some points, but you, I think you've done a great job of, of um, not being too graphic when it came to the rapes. And especially because it, Luna does not escape the, um, the, the horrors that Teresa, and I think Luna's story is also a little more scary because they're, you know, it's, there's more people involved and she's captured. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest difference between the two characters is that Luna really has to survive, um, you know, a much more brutal attack. Um, and you've done a, a, a great job of not making it so graphic that readers are turned off, but a, enough to make us, you know, fully sympathize with this, the, the character. And that was why I was really just curious, at how, where do you draw that line of being too graphic and too intense? And I think you did a great job of, you know, bringing us up to that point of dread, but not grossing people out and not turning off the right. read. Right, so, thank you. Um, but uh, again, to the audience, if you have any questions that you would like to ask Mindy, if you wanna um, put any questions in the chat or into the Q&A, and I'll be happy to relay them to her. Um, let me open up the chat too. Um, otherwise, we, we'll just keep talking about um, there's there's just there's all these little pieces of the of the story. I mean, we have the hospital ship. In, in I know in the United States, we've all seen our hospital ships in action during the pandemic. We have one on the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, so here's a question: Is um, let me move this around. Um, what does the future look like for women in the DRC? Oh, that's a really, really hard um, question to answer because I'm not a researcher or, um, and I'm not living there, but, you know, from what I understand is that things there now are not very different than they are in the book, and they're not really very different. I mean, I, I just, 
it's still the rape capital of the world, you know, and, and unless a girl, a woman is, is educated and, and, you know, I, I can't stress the importance of, of an education, you know, things don't look great for, for women who are uneducated there. Um, I also think that, I mean, there are places when, when these horrific acts are, happen, there are places where women can go. There actually are places like these schools, like these hospitals where people help them. But, but I, you know, there are, there are women who do just fine in Congo too. There are people who live in cities and who are, you know, earning a living and, and who have families and are not necessarily just uh, relegated to schlepping water to and from the river all day. I mean, there are people who do quite well. And, um, you know, there are women who go to school and end up in law school and end up as lawyers and end up as small business people. I mean, um, City of Joy at Eve Ensler's um, center, which is a V Day's center, actually empowers women to sort of become business people. And, you know, you could, they learn martial arts and all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't even know why, why would somebody need that? You know, well, they do. I mean, sometimes there's not an education otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are some really powerful women there, some who have come back from tremendous adversity. And so um, I don't think that one can generalize. It's sort of like, what is the future of women in the US? Well, some of us have fallen on hard luck and some of us haven't. And we just kind of do the best we can, right? Um, it's not a bootstrap situation there so much. I mean, it, it is it is still very dangerous for people to live there, women and men. Mm -hmm. And um, we all know about political corruption and they've got plenty of it there too. So um, yeah, I would like to go back and actually meet some of the women that I met before um, and see how they're doing. I, I feel like I'm, I'm due to go back. Okay. So, so someone's asking, do you know if your book's on sale in the Congo? And, and if it's, how, how has it been received there? Do you know, or? Um, you know, I don't know if international rights for the book have been sold yet. Um, it's very new. This book just came out in October and actually did not hit Amazon until November. So it's only been out for really two months. Um, I know that, that Ingram just, uh, got hold of it, which is wonderful because it means that I'll be in bookstores here. Um, I honestly don't know if people are able to get it in Congo. I should ask. So um, a friend of yours is saying hello, and then they ask about, um, they appreciate the juxtaposition between the title of natural resources and unnatural resources. Um, and of the women you met and wrote about. But he's asking too is where's is your next trip going to be once the world opens back up? Oh, okay, so that's easy. Uh, the next trip I'm going to be, well, I guess the question is if it's, if it's domestic, I'll be going home to visit my dad and my brother um, and uh, to hopefully appear at a, at a gallery event where I'll be discussing my book again, that's in Chicago. Um, but as far as, um, leaving the country, I honestly don't know. I, I think my next trip will probably be to Asia. I, I would love to explore Asia. I've never, I've only been there twice and I would love to, to know more. Um, but yeah, I don't think any of us are going anywhere right now. <laughs> so, and then another question is the people who do quite well in the cities, how involved are they? Um, the citizens of the DRC and the plight of women, men, children in the villages. Um, does most of the intervention help come from outside or from within the DRC? You know, my, in my experience, the people who were really having trouble were people who were out in rural areas, um, you know, who didn't have access to things like radio communication, cell phone communication and stuff like that. Um, I, I know there have been attacks on cities. Um, but you know, people who are farther afield who live out in rural areas are especially vulnerable because they just don't have access to good communication. 
I don't know if that was, did I answer the question? Yeah, no, and I, and I think too, even in part of the book too, um, you do, you see that, that difference between the, the countryside and the city. You right. really, you show that when um, they, they make it past a blockade. That right. you do know that there is this, it's like two different worlds and, and Therese realizes that too that and I think when you're in a bigger city I think the government's more inclined to protect you versus being in a small little village out in the countryside somewhere so right. um, and that and two they have all the UN soldiers there as well who are helping to maintain the peace right um, someone's asked um, what did you find were the ways which women were able to create a more positive life um, could anybody from the Bay volunteer to help women in, the, in that region and how could we best support? So oh my goodness. Well, I have a handy, handy little tip for you all there. At the back of this book, on the last page, is a guide. How can you help? I will read that to you as well. You can donate to Human Rights Watch and check out their Africa department. Uh, read King Leopold's Ghost. If you want to learn about women and their ability to heal, watch the movie City of Joy from Vide. Um, read about the Lake Tanganyika Floating Health Clinic. Read about the Virunga Rangers Fund. And donate to the Fund for Global Human Rights. That's what you can do here. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, it's difficult to actually go to Congo. If you are fortunate enough to go, you will see strong, resilient people and a uh, beautiful country. And, um, you know, the best way I think to support people in Congo is to read about them, to read about them. And, and you know, if you're asking that question, how can I help? Then I really feel like I've done my job already. You know, that makes me really happy. So, well, before we go, though, I, I really want to know, so what are you working on now, Mindy? Okay, um, well, I got a couple things in the hopper right now. Mm -hmm. I did just finish um, the full first draft of my memoir, and I've chosen to put it in the drawer where I put books that I'm marinating on, um, and I've started to work on two separate stories um, one about a conjoined twin and um, another about a child whose um, gender is changing. And so there, those, others, those other stories are actually stories about kids, mm -hmm. um, kids in peril again, but uh, they're, they're, one is set in Asia and one is set here in the U.S. Um, so that's what I'm working on. No, do you think you'll go back and finish that story of Virgil or? or, <laughs> or well, I mean, it? yeah, I think, I think Felix's story is something I would only tackle if I can go back one more time and re-interview some of the child soldiers that I've met when I was there, because I, I don't know if I've got his voice quite right. And in, in um, on Natural Resources, he's mute for a lot of the book. So um so we hear very little about him, but he has a whole story that's already been written. And, and it's, it's just something I, I need to think about um, if I want to tackle this again or if I want to tackle something else. Well, I'm excited to see what you write next. and I can't wait to read it. Are you working on any more um, screenplays for films? Since that was the first thing you need to do is write a screenplay. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have written a rough draft of this, of this book. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't think that's the way that the rights will go. I think they'll, they'll sell the rights to somebody else. Um, I don't really feel like making another movie. It's very, um, it's very labor intensive and I still have kids that are here at home. Um, if I wanted to shoot another movie, I would do it when my kids are off to college. So I got a couple more years with that. Um, I should mention that I, I, um, I kept a, a query tracker for unnatural resources. And um, it's, I have, I left a lot of it blank because I wanted to leave space for my next book. So um, yeah, it's a, 
there's lots of works in progress right now and the pandemic is a great time to work on those things. Well, thank you again for being here with us. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, I would recommend that you, you know, travel to our local bookstores, you know, Copperfields at the Larkspur Landing or, um, uh, oh, I'm always forgetting. I'm, Book Passage. Book Passage. Book Passage is our other favorite place to buy books. Or, you know, you can always um, buy them online. Like she mentioned, it is on sale on Amazon. And then um, we'll also, uh, in the, I'll be sending a, an email with the link to the recording and then to Mindy's website um, and follow her on social media. I do and the library does as well. And we look forward to your next book, Mindy. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and be well. Yeah, you guys have a great afternoon, everybody. And again, well, the Larkspur Library will be open again tomorrow. And thanks you too, Laurel, for, for um, giving me some great tips so we can market Mindy's book. So I'm glad everybody made it today and I'll see you guys soon. You guys all take care. Thank, Thank you, you Franklin. Bye. That was fabulous. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye.